he used a little more foul language than I'm going to say. He said it looked pretty damn good to him. He said he's going to buy some. And I bit my tongue. And then down on the ground, he turned to the chief of the Air Force and he said, uh, why don't you have this young whippersnapper fly this down Pennsylvania Avenue? Rooftop level, I want people to see what I'm going to buy. So I did, I slowed down. I, I slowed down to about 300, 350 knots. But I had never really realized how heavily forested the city of Washington really is. It's a jungle. Well, while going down the avenue and losing the avenue amongst the trees, all of a sudden I looked up and the Capitol Dome was straight ahead. So I had to pull up to go over it. And somebody on the steps took this picture as we were going over the top. The ill-fated trip back to Muroc would help bring the troubled flying wing project to an end. During the flight, six of the bomber's eight jet engines caught fire, forcing an emergency landing in Winslow, Arizona. Later that year, the Air Force's order for 30 flying wing bombers was canceled. But the Northrop company wasn't finished with the flying wing idea. By 1981, aviation technology had changed dramatically with electronic fly-by-wire controls, making a flying wing design much more feasible. Fly-by-wire is basically computer controlled. There's no uh, hydraulic or uh, cable linkage to the, uh, the controls. The computer is monitoring uh, uh, what you want it to do and adjusts the flight controls in accordance with what, what you're asking the airplane to do. Northrop Grumman won a contract to build the Air Force a new bomber that would use Jack Northrop's flying wing concept. Apparently, Jack Northrop got the dimensions right the first time. The new flying wing, called the B-2, would have exactly the same 172-foot wingspan as the old flying wing. The build of that wing was a very, very challenging activity for us. Uh, the team overcame day in and day out. We used to call it an invention a day uh, to get us through the day. And uh, it's probably as exciting a time as you'd ever uh, come across. Jack Northrop, who was, was still very alert and very much interested in flight, had the chance, shortly before he died, to learn about the existence of the B-2 program. And he was very touched. And he said now he knew why God had let him live as long as he had. The B-2 stealth bomber was first revealed to the public in 1988, when it was rolled out of its hangar at the Air Force's Plant 42. To many, it signified that the flying wing design had finally become a successful bomber. To me, it was a vindication for Glenn's death. My work and his death were not in vain. We did accomplish uh, something. We didn't do it, but somebody accomplished the final act of making a system like that. The B-2's first flight came the following year with test pilot Bruce Hines at the controls. When Bruce Hines was going to fly it, they asked me to talk to him. I told him, I can't tell you anything. It's a different airplane. Just one thing, Bruce, don't stall the airplane. And so after he flew it, I said, Bruce, did you try stalling him? I said, Bob, the damn thing won't let you. It won't let you stall it. The first production B-2 was delivered to the Air Force in 1993. The 69-foot-long bombers are powered by four jet engines and carry two pilots. They're designed to carry 40,000 pounds of conventional or nuclear bombs and can fly at altitude.